All right, a little introduction to the time period before I read this aloud for you. Um, in 1816, there's a presidential election. Uh, James Madison was elected to two terms. He served for eight years, and then he's going to be followed up by James Monroe, who is another man from Virginia. So um, Monroe is the fifth president, and out of the five presidents so far, um, one two, three, four of them, four of the five have been from Virginia, if that tells you anything. He is a former Revolutionary War hero. He is a diplomat. He was involved in the Louisiana Purchase, so he has international experience, and he also has political experience serving in the legislature in Virginia and also as governor of Virginia. So he definitely has a pedigree, and uh, he's the president. But while he's president, something's going to happen with this guy, Andrew Jackson. So this is our first introduction to Andrew Jackson. No, it isn't. I'm sorry. We learned that he fought in the Battle of New Orleans, and that's where he made a name for himself. And now um, this story is about his involvement in us getting Florida. On your last map test, Florida was included, even though you had not learned about how we got Florida yet. But I told you at the time we were going to be learning about that soon. So today's the day. So this uh, centers around Andrew Jackson, but it's happening while James Monroe is the president. So I'm just going to read this and you're going to answer questions that come at the end. Um, we're looking for where did the Seminole Indians live? What two problems did the U.S. identify in Florida? What does ambiguous mean? You're going to have to look that up or use context clues. What did Andrew Jackson do in Florida? What ultimatum did John Quincy Adams issue to Spain? How does the story end? Name the treaty that was signed between the US and Spain. That is also something you'll need to look up. So try to find the answers to these as I read. If you wanna keep pausing it to answer the questions as we go, you could do that because I think they pretty much go in order. Eviction of Indians and taking of Florida. In the next few years, Jackson continued to serve as Major General over much of the Southeast with a salary of $2,400 a year and $1,652 in expenses. His staff lived with him, including Sam Houston, the future hero of Texas, and John Eaton to be heard from later. The main military activity at that time was the driving of Indians out of lands which white Americans were pouring into or were about to pour into. Sometimes there was the justification of Indian raids and massacres, sometimes not. One such affair, the First Seminole War, resulted in U.S. acquisition of Florida. Spain was fighting a losing battle against revolutions in South America. Florida was mostly a vast swampland, and being separated from the rest of Spanish territory, it just caused a dispersal of military manpower. Added to the U.S., however, it would make borders tidier and more defensible, largely preventing, for example, the sort of north-south pincer movement the British tried in 1814. Also, the Seminole Indians straddled the Florida-Georgia border, and they could and did make crossbred raids retreating to the other side when pursued. Another reason Spanish Florida was seen as a danger by the US was that it contained a fort inhabited by escaped slaves who it was felt encouraged other slaves to run away to its safety. The fort was blown up in 1816, killing 270. In late 1817, in response to the burning of an Indian village on US territory, Seminoles massacred virtually all on board a transport. Four men out of 40 escaped, one woman out of seven was spared, and the four children on board were all killed. It appears in hindsight that President Monroe somewhat expected Jackson to occupy Florida and gave him ambiguous signals to that effect. The sort of signals that executives sometimes give their charges when they don't want to be blamed for an action. Jackson went into Florida with a couple of thousand men and occupied the fort at St. Mark's 
in the east and the fortified town of Pensacola, the center of Spanish rule in Florida. He also had two British subjects, allies of the Indians, hanged. The Spanish minister demanded evacuation and suitable punishment for Jackson. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams's reply berated the Spanish for not restraining the Indians and included the following. Spain must immediately decide either to place a force in Florida adequate at once to the protection of her territory or cede to the United States a province of which she retains nothing but the nominal possession, but which is in fact a post of annoyance to them. This in effect said, keep the inhabitants of Florida in line or we'll do it for you. Behind the scenes, Secretary of War John C. Calhoun Secretary of the Treasury William H. Crawford and Representative Henry Clay of Kentucky were perturbed. Calhoun was angry over Jackson's communications with the president, bypassing him. All three men had presidential ambitions, and Jackson's popularity threatened their hopes. Adams, however, backed Jackson up. Since Jackson was eventually sustained, he attributed it somewhat to his Secretary of War Calhoun. Jackson had to put up with being called before Congress and berated, particularly by Henry Clay, whom Jackson was coming to hate. Four resolutions to censure Jackson failed, however. Adams negotiated a treaty buying Florida for $5 million and also giving the U.S. a very wide corridor in the West to the Pacific. Jackson then received the military governorship of Florida, while it was being integrated as a U.S. territory. He did a good job while there of shaping new institutions compatible with integration in the U.S. He did, however, as in New Orleans, use some heavy-handed tactics at times. So you can look up words that you don't know uh, to help you understand the meaning of these sentences, if necessary, and of course, answer these questions.